Hello everyone, I'm Professor Geek. Welcome back to my channel. And welcome to my spoiler-free review slash analysis of Ant-Man and Wasp. And yes, I am going to be spoiler-free in this video. That's always difficult to do when I'm adding an analysis because if you're going to analyze something, you do need to go more in-depth with it. But I think I've discovered a nice happy medium here in my topics, so I think we'll be fine. So overall, review reaction to the film was it was wonderful. It truly was great, and I'll talk about why and all of that in a moment. But before I do, I wanted to address some of the fears and concerns I've been hearing, a little bit like The Incredibles 2 when I was talking about that film. There is the concern in today's climate with all of the social justice warrioring and so forth that a film that makes a point to focus on the, the female heroes or whatever could be playing into something like that. I understand that concern as I did with The Incredibles 2, even though I don't think it was the case with The Incredibles 2 at all. And I don't think it's the case with Ant-Man and Wasp. And I just wanted to say that while, yes, that concern is valid and one should be wary, I think it's really important to consider these films on their own merits, not the industry's inclinations or certain filmmakers' possible agendas or whatever. Many of us who are opposed to the enforced political agendas into films, we think it hurts the story. That's why. I think if we ever came to a place where we immediately rejected or discredited a film simply based on its diversity casting or something like that, then we would be guilty of the exact same thing that we are blaming the agenda-driven filmmakers of. Placing story in the back seat and the diversity of a cast in the front seat when it should be the other way around. Basically what I'm trying to say with that is that if we go to a film which features a lot of diversity before or behind the camera, whatever, that doesn't matter. We should judge it by its story. And if it ends up being enforced political agenda, which hurt the story, then yes, we need to continue to speak out about that. But if that's not the case, if it's a great story that actually merits whatever elements are in the film, then we need to admit that and say, yeah, this was great because of this, and this is why this was still story-driven, and so forth. So that's what I'm going to do with Ant-Man and Wasp. I haven't heard this as much with Ant-Man and Wasp as I did with Incredibles 2, because it just sort of makes sense. I mean, the end of Ant-Man, we saw Hope Van Dyne receive her suit, and we knew throughout the course of that film that she was the more experienced one with these powers. It just made sense that in a sequel we would see her shine a lot more, and we do, and it's great. I can say that the film is thoroughly about the Ant-Man and the Wasp, though. It's not automatically the Wasp movie, and now Ant-Man just has to take a back seat. It truly is about Scott Lang and Hope Van Dyne. They are the two main characters of the movie. The next thing that we need to do when we try to review or analyze a sequel is we need to have a thorough understanding of the first film, or else we won't really be able to meet the sequel on its own terms, and we'll be missing the foundation. Because a sequel should do certain things based on the first film. The movie Ant-Man was a superhero movie, obviously, but the subgenre of that within the Marvel Cinematic Universe was that it was a heist film. And as a good heist film should be, it's centered around one major heist at the end. That was the basic structure of the film. And in Ant-Man and Wasp, the sequel, we are still in the heist film genre, but it does what a good sequel should do, which is to really blast that open. There's not a single heist centerpiece in this film, and it shouldn't be for a sequel. We have dramatic and thrilling car chases, we do have some heist work, and it steps up the genre well for what a sequel should do. Character-wise, when you have a sequel, all of the great character stuff that people loved about the first film should absolutely still be there in the second film. And I can happily say that's the case in Ant-Man and Wasp. We still have Scott Lang, our lovable, filterless character that he is, the dynamic between him and Hank and Hope, even though they've been through some stuff and are working out things that has happened since the first film, it's still there. The core of those relationships are still there, and that is good. Thematically, the first film had a number of things going on. We had the echoes of father-daughter relationships with Hank and Hope, and then, of course, with Scott and Cassie. And there was even the inclusion of the father-son relationships, or at least father-figure, son-figure, with Hank and Darren Cross, and then moving on to Hank and Scott. There was a little bit of a what's in your past coming back to haunt you, but really the main theme that that first film drew out was legacy. What are we leaving to our children? That was the real pressing theme of that film because everything Scott Lang did, he did it for Cassie. He did it to leave her a better world. He was trying to be a better dad because he hadn't been, and he thought about her so long when he was in prison and so forth. We had 
Hank doing everything he's doing for Hope, trying to keep her safe, not telling her about her mother. And then Darren Cross, his motivation as a villain is his anger at being passed over as one to receive the, the birthright, so, so to speak, from Hank with the legacy of his research and so forth. That went to Scott. So that was the pressing theme, the main one that really rose to the surface in the first film. You can't use the same central theme in a sequel, but you can't diverge too far from it either. And one of the things that Ant-Man and Wasp did extremely well was it took that theme of your past, things in your past coming back to haunt you or to reward you or whatever. We saw that theme down on the list in the first film, but that's the one that really rises to the surface in the sequel. And that's really cool to see. And this comes up with Scott's own past, of course, you know, being in prison and so forth, but also the past decisions that he'd made with Captain America Civil War and the fallout from that in both of his legal standing and his relationship with Hank and Hope. The past literally comes back to haunt them because, and this isn't a spoiler, you know this from basic previews or or basic common knowledge being read and reported about the film, is that we will have Janet Van Dyne in the film played by Michelle Pfeiffer. So Janet Van Dyne, who was lost to the quantum realm in the first movie, in the flashback anyway, part of this film is trying to retrieve her. We knew that was coming with the setup in the first movie. It's not a spoiler, but that's a literal thing from the past coming back. So we have it there. We have it in Scott's own past. Even in the secondary characters, Luis and his crew, they're working out their own past mistakes and certain things coming back from their past, they are trying to make good on. The villain has a wonderful past story about past coming back to haunt her. So a great central theme there. We do also have the echo of father-daughter relationships. You can't get away from that. That's the structure that Ant-Man universe is built on with Scott and Cassie and Hank and Hope. And we have an added relationship in this film. And I won't say much about it because I don't want to spoil anything, but especially in the end, there's a, there's a relationship between two characters And it's not a biological parenthood, but it's a male character who had taken on a fatherly role to a female character. And in the end, something happens that no one could really blame him if he left, if he stopped being this grown woman at this point's father figure. The situation is such that he wouldn't be a clearly painted bad guy for doing that, but he refuses to. And he says, I will not leave you. And I thought that was great. It happened toward the end as well. And that really hammered home the idea that your past is going to come back to you. Whether that's past commitments, past decisions, past mistakes, past triumphs or whatever, you are the product of your past and it is going to come back to be dealt with at times. And I love that echo of staying committed to the decision he made to to take care of this girl and be a father figure to her. That was really great. And it struck a chord with me, of course, because I am the father of a daughter. So it's going to mean something a little bit more to me than it might other other people, but anyone can get the gist. The film continued to balance humor and the comedy with the action and the thrills and the high stakes. That was wonderful to see. The action did step up quite a bit. The movie was able to play with the absurdity of the props for, for shrinking down and seeing things that are normally quite small to see them at a big scale. The first film did this a little bit, especially with the, the train fight scene at the end of Ant-Man. It couldn't do that too much, though, because it was still trying to establish itself in the Marvel Cinematic Universe and establish just the film with the audience. If it played too much into that stuff, it could have been blamed for being a gimmick. The sequel has more reign to really explore and have more fun with that, and it does. That one scene in particular from the trailers that everyone has seen with Wasp flying through the air and running upon the knives blades that are being thrown at her, that whole scene would have made a wonderful amusement park ride at Disney World. I hope it will one day. That'd be really great. But the last thing I'll say about the movie, and one of the things I loved about it so much, was where it falls within this larger beast of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I've talked a lot in different videos, most recently in the video about the changing role of a producer and why I think Kathleen Kennedy has failed, where Kevin Feige has succeeded in terms of heading up a shared cinematic universe. And that is the fact that each film has to work on its own. It has to work in its own sequence of trilogies or whatever it might be within, but it also has to work within the larger picture, within the larger cinematic universe, which is one overall big story that's being told, and it deserves to be adhered to. And this film does that quite well, but also if you think about the Marvel Cinematic Universe and the pacing of it, we're at a crucial time right now having just left Infinity War. That was a serious blow. Even though we know certain things are going to happen here and there, Still, if you're following the story and watching the films currently as they come out or in order later or whatever, you get to Avengers Infinity War and that's a blow. That 
that shakes you. If you care about the characters at all, if you follow the story, you're a bit shaken after that. And Ant-Man and Wasp is exactly what we needed after that movie. It takes place, of course, before the events of Infinity War, to a certain degree. And it just gives us the story of the tried-and-true Marvel formula of the characters we enjoy spending time with and the universe we enjoy spending time in. So it's exactly what we needed. It didn't ignore the fact that Infinity War happened, though. And that's what I appreciated about the film. I'm not going to spoil this at all, but after you've seen the entire movie, also make sure you stay for the post credit scenes, of course. But it does find a way to remind you that this whole Thanos thing is still something that has to be dealt with. Uh, it does that without sacrificing the good time that you just desperately needed psychologically right now within the Marvel Cinematic Universe. It does that quite well. So, great balance there. That's about all I can give you analysis-wise without jumping into spoilers, so I will leave it there, maybe after the film has been out for a while, or maybe even when it comes on DVD, I'll go into a deeper analysis. But the first Ant-Man was one of my favorite Marvel Cinematic Films, easily in my top five. And now, Ant-Man and Wasp, I'm going to have to find a high place for that, too, in there somewhere, because it was so much fun and found the right depth within that fun. And that's what a good film should do in the Hollywood entertainment business. So that's all I'll prattle on about that. Do let me know if you end up going to see the film, what you think or what you're expecting from the movie. We do have Captain Marvel coming up, which again obviously takes place back in time in the 90s. So we have that story to experience as well before we find out how the Avengers Infinity War Saga is going to end in the cinematic universe. So I will definitely keep tabs on that and talk about that. I do think a lot of the things going around in the social media right now about the Marvel Cinematic Universe is going to begin pandering to the SGW agendas and stuff. I do hear a lot of the fears going on in the media right now due to comments that certain people have made and the fears that the Marvel Cinematic Universe will be more agenda-driven now. I'm not quite concerned about that yet. I think that Kevin Feige is a wise marketer and he knows what he needs to say to keep everybody happy, but he's always shown to keep story first. So as long as he continues to do that, I will certainly see the films. And when he stops, then I will certainly speak out about it. But let me know your thoughts, and until next time, keep enjoying and digging deeper into the hero stories you love. Thanks for watching.